Yo, thank you, Titan lovers. We are back with our first recap of our new favorite Run For Your Eyes show, Monarch. I'm your host, Anthony. I'm going to do my best to be your guide in this monstrous show as we're picking up where the MonsterVerse movies left off with Godzilla, King Kong, and other monstrous creatures not only confirmed to exist, but being accepted as a part of life of the world. This first episode is titled Aftermath, which is a pretty deep title with multiple meanings. For one, we're watching a show about a scientific organization that pretty much specializes in investigating the aftermath of the discovery of the Titans. The appearance of Godzilla was a game changer for the world, with the way of life now being shaped around the existence of the Titans, which is a pretty mind-blowing fact once you see how much everyday life has changed. Another meaning is the aftermath that Kentaro and Kate's father left in the wake of his absence. His families are in shock and disarray with his absence, but also with their discovery that their father had multiple families, the aftermath of which has left them all devastated. And I can't wait to dig into all the destruction, the chaos, and the tea. But first, do me a favor. If you're new here, please consider giving this channel a like and subscribe to keep up with our weekly Monarch analyses and breakdowns. I'm truly grateful for you allowing me to have your time, your absolute time. I understand how valuable that is. I would truly be grateful if you could also hit that like button. Please, please hit the like button. YouTube still uses this to help smaller channels like me to grow even in 2023. Like, subscribe, turn on notifications, comment, all that good stuff, and join us every week right after these videos are published in order to help figure out the mystery of Monarch. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. This first episode opens with a helicopter that's making that, you know, that familiar flyover, that gorgeous tropical island. Now, most of us recognize this place as it's the incredible Skull Island, home of the colossal titan King Kong. We even see Kong for a moment as the show flashes back to the time in 1973 with John Goodman's character, William Randa, making an appearance along with that ragtag group of soldiers that escorted him to the island in order to research the location and its many wonders back in Kong Skull Island. It's at this moment that we see Dr. Randa is leaving what is the equivalent of a message in a bottle as he records a message to, I don't know, someone apologizing for his actions, but also explaining how, from his point of view, his actions were justified because he's leaving a legacy. We then see Randa hauling ass, I mean, booking it, running for his life, as he's being chased by a colossal sized titan that we learn to lovingly refer to as Mother Long Legs. Unfortunately for Randa, he ran out of forest and he's still being chased. And what's even worse is, as he continues getting chased outside the forest, he then starts running out of land to run on and comes across that familiar and maybe overused movie trope of being stuck between a pursuer and a literal cliff with Dr. Randa coming to the end of the island and seeing nothing in front of him but the ocean as he stands atop a very large cliff. Like, we see this all the time in movies and TV shows and it just never gets old with me. Interestingly enough, Randa chooses to throw his satchel off the cliff and into the ocean below as he prepares to make his way to meet the creator. And right before Mother Longlegs is about to stick her legs in him and we find out if he's going to get spider powers, they both get interrupted by the emergence of a giant crab looking titan. That makes an awesome entrance as the titan emerges literally from beneath the surface of the cliff in order to take on and fight Mother Longlegs in a battle to the death. Now, I love how this show understood the assignment and opened up with some giant ass titans fighting to the death in the opening segment. I know that there are more than a few of us who watch these movies and scream at the screen that we need more monsters. And like I said, Monarch is off to a good start with this battle right here. Interestingly enough, they completely ignore and forget that Randa is even there and their fight spills over and sees them tumbling into the ocean, seemingly to their death as Randa watches from the cliff and sees that satchel that he threw into the water below, it, it's starting to float away. We then fast forward to the year 2013 on what looks like a fishing ship with one of those those crane things with the nets. Y'all yeah, know what I'm talking about, right? That crane thing. And it looks like they also picked up Dr. Randa's satchel with the fish. But since it just looks like sea trash, they just kind of set it to the side and ignore it. It looks kind of gross. 
We then switched to a young woman riding in a plane to Tokyo, Japan on WTA Airlines. And the strangest thing happens when they land as the entire group of passengers are then sprayed by some sort of disinfected by the airline staff wearing brightly colored hazmat suits. The young woman is all sorts of confused, but also triggered to what appears to be a memory of men wearing dark hazmat suits while holding assault rifles as they walk through some sort of fog or mist on the road in the rain. Now, another passenger explains to the woman, it's something that they do now ever since the monster attacks. Once they finish, everyone is allowed to exit the plane and head on to the airport. But as the woman is walking, we see a pretty strong military presence in the airport. And the woman sees a symbol on the floor for Godzilla evacuation routes. And this is when we hear that familiar Godzilla roar and we see the woman have some sort of flashbacks of Godzilla seemingly during one of his previous appearances. The woman then makes her way to a border control officer to check her in and asks her what is the purpose of her visitation and she explains that her father recently passed away and she's here to settle his affairs. The agent then scans her fingerprints and stamps her passport with the date April 1st, 2015. Hold that date in the back of your head. We then see the woman riding into Tokyo and looking at all the sites and landmarks and graffiti. The woman seems to reach her destination at an apartment building and on her way inside, she receives a call from her mother who, you know, comments that she didn't get her call that she was supposed to get when she landed. Anyway, the woman seems genuinely surprised to see that one of her keys that she had with her opened the apartment door that she was walking into and she was leaving me, her mom, and everyone else who was watching sitting at the edge of our seats to see what it is that she's gonna find inside this place. The young woman opens the door and sees what looks like an ordinary apartment? I mean, there's some shoes, uh, there's a TV, there's pictures of some guy on top of one of the bookcases along with his family hanging up all over the house. And the woman takes a few moments to stare at some of the pictures when another woman in the house freaks all the way out when she sees that there's this intruder in her home staring at her family photos. A guy comes running out of a nearby room to see what the F is going on in his living room. And the young woman who's there also is a little bit freaked out and starts demanding answers about where they got these pictures on the wall. And first off, when you walk into someone else's house, it's kind of rude to just show up unannounced and start asking questions like, where do you get those pictures of yourself on the wall and why are they there? Like, that's weird. The guy and the older woman start demanding answers about how the young woman got the keys to their house and the young woman blurts out that she found the keys on her father's desk along with a lease to this place in her father's name. The guy and older woman look like they're about to tell this lady she got one more minute to start making some sense before they pounce and the young woman says that the dude in the family pictures is her father and whoa. <laughs> Before we get any further answers, we then switch to a whole nother group of people riding around in an old janky looking Jeep. And the group is made up of two guys and a woman and one of the guys in the car is definitely not Captain America. His actual name is Lee Shaw. This group makes some small talk about how janky their car is and we learn that the guy and the woman are a couple. They have a kid together too and that they're investigating what I assume are the mysterious radiation readings and they seem to be riding in the direction along the countryside while following what looks like, you know, increasing readings. Oh yeah, they all work for Monarch. They continue riding and continue following the radiation until they finally reach their destination, they exit their vehicle and continue walking toward the radiation. Now. We all know as fans that Titans chase radiation like catnip, so it's only fair to assume that this group's investigation has something to do with Titans. They eventually park their vehicle, break and enter into someone's private property with privilege, and start making their way through some sort of forest in search of what they described as a network that ties together the Titans. As they're making their way through the forest, out of nowhere, some random kid pops up on them with a gun aimed at Lee's head and Cap looks like he's ready to send this kid to meet his maker. The woman of the group starts to defuse the situation and negotiates on everyone's behalf, explaining that they're just here to investigate the contamination, with the kid saying that the contamination is Cap and it was made up to keep people away. He then offers to lead the group further into the forest to show them what it's really going on and that's the part right there that just felt like plot convenience because what kid with a gun just trusts strangers and then offers to guide them through the forest to point out everyone's secrets? That just is weird. As they get further into the forest, the group comes upon what looks like an old factory. 
and the woman in the group tells the rest of them that she's not detecting any radiation anymore. Oh, and that mysterious boy just vanished just as quickly as his convenient ass appeared with the group now making their way toward the factory. We then switch back to the Jerry Springer show with the young woman from earlier who broke into her dad's house with the guy and his mom asking her 21 questions. Then they're asking that the young woman prove that the dad in their pictures is her dad too and oh she's got receipts and starts whipping out her family photos showing that her dad was just as active in her life as he was in her brother's life and yeah this whole thing is as messy as a Nick Cannon family portrait. The young woman gets a little sassy with her brother whom we learn his name Kentaro. The mom then asks if the young woman can tell them anything as their father seemingly just vanished on them and it doesn't seem like that they have any idea where he is. The young woman then decides that she's had enough drama for the day, leaves the keys on the table and makes her way towards the exit. We then switch back to the monarch group continuing to track down the radiation and noticing a pattern of radiation appearing and subsiding which absolutely makes me think of that first Godzilla movie and how the titans had a healthy appetite for radiation. Anyway, Mystery Inc. then continues their investigation and starts setting up seismic charges to help them map out the area below them to get some answers. When they discover that there are caverns beneath them that seem to match what it is that they're looking for in a network. And that is what is supposed to tie all of the Titans together. We then switch back to the sassy young woman from before who's having a walk of shame moment through the streets of Japan. She gets a phone call from her mom again who's wondering what the F is going on and the young woman whom we learned is named Kate tells her that the apartment she visited belonged to her dad but stops short of telling her mom that it also belonged to her dad's other family. Before she can continue her conversation alarms go off in the streets of Japan with Kentaro and his mom appearing out of nowhere and they start leading Kate to the Godzilla evacuation route where they wait to find out if the alarm is just a drill or if it's another San Francisco moment. Now those that don't know the San Francisco event that they're referring to is the fight that Godzilla had with the Mutos in 2014's Godzilla movie where Godzilla showed up to defend San Francisco but truth be told Titans really don't give a fly f about collateral damage they don't care. We then get treated to a flashback of that moment when Godzilla was crossing through the Golden Great Bridge and when I mean crossing through it I mean he literally ripped the thing in half and we learned that Kate was actually there that day and she was riding on a school bus full of children that seems eerily familiar to anyone who saw the movie with Kate making her escape off of the back of the school bus but unfortunately she wasn't able to rescue more than just a handful of kids before the bus got destroyed in the commotion. We then get flash forward to the present and Kate is all the way freaking out as she's absolutely traumatized by the experience and seems to be suffering through some sort of PTSD and even goes as far as to having a panic attack and tries to leave the underground evacuation center as if that's the smart thing to do. Kentaro's mom may have just saved her life and holds her back and stops her from leaving with Kentaro not lifting a finger to help. And oddly enough, Kentaro's mom embraces Kate and helps calm her down so that she can stop acting up. We then switch back to the small monarch group making their way further into the factory where they come across what looks like a bunch of muto eggs or embryos at the bottom of the factory and making me have flashbacks to that 2000 Godzilla movie with Ferris Bueller saving the world. Oh and Puff Daddy making rock music. The monarch group starts thinking it's a smart idea to walk up to the embryos in order to get samples from the monsters for further scientific study. Lee tries to talk some sense into them but you know this is how all bad movie ideas go but before he can talk some sense into them the woman is already strapped up and ready to rappel down to get her sample and her husband who we learned is named Billy agrees with her and they outvote not Cap I mean Lee in what it is that they're going to be doing next. Lee gives up and agrees to give the woman five minutes to head down and get her samples while Lee and Billy wait behind and keep an eye on things from up high. We then switch back to Kate, Kentaro, and Kentaro's mom in the evacuation center who finally hear the all clear that it was just a false alarm and they have permission to go back to normal life. Kentaro is not with the ish and starts giving Kate some sass for being there and I barely know any Japanese words, uh, mainly just the ones I remember from watching old subtitled DBZ episodes, but I absolutely heard Kentaro's mom say the word Otusa to Kentaro while talking about Kate which if I remember correctly means the word father. Again 
I'm not 100% sure on what Kentaro's mom is saying, but if any of you who are better with Japanese do know what she's saying, please help us all out and drop us a hint in the comments. Anyway, I gotta admit, I love how quickly Kate and Kentaro are catching up on sibling rivalry. These two hate each other, and it's pretty damn clear that Kentaro would have been the brother to have an absolute fit at the idea of sharing his toys with his sister. Anyway, Kentaro's mom then invites Kate to come back with them to have some tea and, and asks her to tell them about her life. Kate continues being sassy and says she has nothing less she'd like to do than have tea with the woman her dad was cheating on her mom with. Kentaro tries to talk her into staying and even offers to show Kate something in another part of town. They make their way to some random blue building and then head into an office where we see more family photos of their dad with Kentaro and his mom. Kentaro and Kate continue their sibling rivalry and talk shit to each other for a while with Kate discovering a hidden safe on the wall behind the map. Kate continues talking shit and with Kentaro's help, they're able to figure out the combination to the safe, telling Kentaro that the code was a combination of everyone's birthdays. And Yo, that's some real Jerry Springer stuff for real. Like, I can't even front everyone's birthdays. Kate opens the safe and pulls out. Yo, it's that satchel that Dr. Randa threw into the ocean at the beginning of the episode. Kate sees it and the monarch symbol stitched on the side and has another flashback to that day on the bridge in San Francisco where she saw a bunch of guys walking around her with that monarch symbol on their clothes. Kate finds some computer drives in the bag and offers to make a deal with Kentaro that if he helps her figure out what's on them, she'll get out of his life forever. We then switch to Kentaro and Kate meeting up with some woman that looks like Iris West in an alley eating noodles, with Kentaro asking her to help him read the data on the drives. The woman is not in the mood to help Kentaro and reveals that she used to be in a relationship with Kentaro, and he's got some friggin' nerve showing up here asking her for help for some janky ass drives. Kentaro has nothing, especially when she airs out how he ghosted her and shows up when he needs tech support, especially with another woman. Somehow they convince this woman to help them and we learn her name is May. They make their way into May's apartment where she's able to start working on reading the data on the drives that they brought. She loads up the drive and finds that the data is encrypted, but she's able to read the data because it's outdated tech. We then see that the second May accesses the drive, it sets off alarm somewhere else in a military looking Monarch facility, which excites the hell out of the people in Monarch, especially this one dude in glasses who's changing all of his plans and immediately starts getting things in order to head to Japan to figure out what the hell is going on. We then switch back to May and company who are continuing to read the drives and they start looking through the files in it, including a photo of what looks like Bigfoot and some confidential Monarch documents. Kate recognizes the monarch symbol and shares that she saw that symbol back in San Francisco. She finally shares with Kentaro that their dad wasn't there in San Francisco when Godzilla marched through, and we learn that the day is lovingly referred to as G-Day. We then get another flashback to that day after the attack with Kate walking through some sort of medical camp that's treating the survivors of that attack with Kate getting a call from her dad and even briefly meets up with him at the camp where he hands Kate a bus ticket for Kate and her mom to get out of town and tells them that he's not staying or going with them, saying that there's something he has to do. Kate is rightfully pissed because who doesn't want their dad in the aftermath of a tragedy? Kate's dad dips just as quickly as he appeared, much to the disappointment and anger of Kate, and we learn that Kate is sharing this story with Kentaro and May, and then lets us all know that she never saw her dad again. In her reports that he was on a bush plane that disappeared in Alaska, but the state police never found the wreckage. Kentaro is defensive of his dad and says that he must have had a good reason, but Kate isn't so sure. May continues going through the files with one of the pictures catching Kate's attention and explaining that it's a photo of Kate's grandmother standing in what looks like a picture of one of Godzilla's footprints. Kentaro then chimes in and says that she died when their dad was little. And oh shit! Their grandmother is the woman from the factory scenes! The one that's collecting samples. And it's in this moment that we learn that these two storylines are taking place at different points in time. And what we're watching is actually a shining example of non-linear storytelling. We then switch back to their grandmother, Keiko, rappelling down a rope into the factory to collect her samples. Things go about as well as you'd expect with Keiko taking like five steps near the embryos before the ground beneath them literally starts falling away. Bill, Keiko's husband, then finally agrees to grab his wife and escape as the whole building begins to collapse on them. 
And oh yeah, the Titan embryos are start to hatch and immediately start chasing after Keiko and Lee in order to get something to eat. And yo, it is really not looking too good for Keiko because these creatures are fast. And before we know it, Keiko gets pulled into the pit and disappears into the chaos below. And end credits. And wow. Okay, Monarch. I see that y'all understood the assignment and gave us plenty of Titan action and even a cameo or two from Godzilla and King Kong while introducing a whole bunch of new characters and a mystery to look into. Why the hell did Kate and Kentaro's dad have two families? What the F, dude? And what the hell was he working on that was so secret that kept him away from his families? It's pretty clear that the kid that Keiko and Bill mentioned that they had earlier in the episode was actually Kentaro and Kate's dad. And it also seems that this Bill guy that we're seeing is actually a younger version of John Goodman's character, William Randa from Kong Skull Island. But what the hell happened to Kate and Kentaro's dad? And what was he doing on a bush plane in Alaska? Did he work for Monarch or did he work against Monarch? Did he inherit his father's work? I love how this show is picking up on pre-existing story and characters and fleshing them out to help add to the world of the MonsterVerse, but I have so many questions. What did you all think of this episode? I'd love to see what you guys think about this one in the comments. Anyway, that's all I have for this one. As usual, hey guys, if you like this video, you wanna see more, please do me a favor, hit the like button, please hit, hit the, Hit the like button, subscribe, turn on your notifications, join us every week so we could investigate the mystery of Monarch. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to check you all later. Peace.